Once again, friends and listeners, we're here in the K-Swiss podcast studio in downtown LA for another episode of CEOs Wear Sneakers, where we interview entrepreneurs, bosses, founders, CEOs, people that we think are the new heroes of youth culture and that can inspire us, inspire you. And hopefully you can leave with some tangible tips and tricks and lessons from the stories we tell from these amazing people we get to meet. And today I'm delighted to have with me a founder of some amazing companies, including Basecamp, which some of you may use for your project management, Ruby on Rails, and a four-time best-selling author. His name is David Heinemeyer Hansen. David, welcome to CEOs Wear Sneakers. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Great to have you. And I skimmed over your resume there in that intro, but I know there's tons of it. In fact, I was reading reading through and doing some of my research, and it was amazing the stuff you've done. I'm surprised you're not 80 years old, but from all you've, all you've accomplished. Um, so let's let's dig into it. So um, you know, before I get into some of the things you've worked on and some of the companies you've started, tell me a little bit about the backstory of you. Sure. So I'm originally from Copenhagen, Denmark. I grew up in sort of the outskirts of Copenhagen, and I got into computers, which became my life's work and my life's interest. Uh, pretty early on, I got my first computer at six years old, an Amstrad 646. Wow. Um, I really wanted a Commodore 64, but I couldn't get one of those. So I got wow, an you, Amstrad. You might be so. older than you look if you <laughs> had the, the Commodore 1664. Yeah, th this was, uh, I think the 64 came out in like 81 or something like that and, and had a, a long, glorious run. Back then, I mean, technology would last, right? Like we. I was just watching the Apple announcements this morning and they're like, oh, new thing is out. It's twice as fast. Like it just goes so fast. Like back then, yeah. the 64 comes out in like 81, basically entirely unchanged for like four years. Like nothing yeah. happens. I think I had the ZX Spectrum. With, does that sound yep, right? That yeah, that was in the same What's generation. Sort of like it, was, it was those keys. three. It was the CX, yeah. it was the Commodore 64, and uh -huh. it was the Amstrad. Yep. Anyway, I got the Amstrad. I tried to learn how to program on it because I really wanted to make games and I just failed. I couldn't figure it out as a six, seven year old how to do this stuff. This was back then where you're like, you'd get a magazine and then at the back of the magazine, there'd be a game. It was just all typed out. You right. had to type it in. Yes. And it took like 45 minutes to type the game in. And if you make one mistake, like one letter is off or one comma is off, the whole thing didn't work. I don't think I ever got one of those games to work. <laughs> but that kind of got me just interested in video games, in computers, and I kept prodding at it. I kept trying over the years to, to get further into it. And then in, I'm about 14 or so. Um, I take my computer to one of these demo parties where you would log your huge tower and your huge CRT monitor under the other arm and you'd carry it onto a train and I would go to this uh, different part of, of Denmark and I would set it all up and we'd have these demo parties, people making like essentially like mu music videos with computers. Yeah. I'm 14 and at that one event, I meet like all the amazing programmers I would then still know like 25 years later. Really? It was just this one singular uh, event where I knew maybe one guy showing up and I walked away there with friends that would last me, well, the lifetime so far. And I really got kickstarted into computers then. And then that took me into the internet and started working with HTML and pursuing these two things at the same time, gaming on the one hand and, and computers on the other hand. And I kept doing the, the computers because I wanted, I was just passionate about games. Would write about video games, have websites and so on. Long story short, 2001, I've gone through all these gaming websites, I've run all these things, and then I realized I actually like the computer stuff better. Like I really like video games, but I'm kind of getting a little, I don't know, tired of that scene. But all this stuff I had to build to get all my passion about video games out there, I really like that. I really like building information systems. I really like building websites. I really and like the internet. Pre, when you started, the, the, you, you, the stuff you were talking about is pre-World pre Wide Web, right? Yeah, I think, um, this was when I really got involved with the internet. That was like 96, 97. It had just sort of okay. taken off 95, 94, um, a couple of years into it. Um, and it was just, it was so amazing because what I loved about the internet and finding it at that point was I didn't have to ask anyone for permission. Like the internet yeah. was this magical medium where what I was used to was, was magazines. Like if you wanted to get your stuff in a magazine, you have to convince an editor and you have right. to, if you even wanted to publish a magazine, you had to have a lot of money for printing. You have to have uh, all these contacts. I knew nothing of that. 
and but I really wanted to do it. All my sort of aspirations were all these video game magazines that I was curious about. Boom, here comes the internet and says, hey, you can just teach yourself HTML, which I did. You can just teach yourself how to cut images up in Photoshop, a pirate copy of Photoshop, which I did. So you, you get all these tools and you could put it out there and you get this response from people all over the world. And you go like, man, this is just amazing. So I want were, more of were, this. You were one of those people who was in there early. And when you say teach yourself HTML, was it as simple as that? I mean, are you just a natural learner? No, I mean, in part because, as I said, I tried to learn programming computers quite a few times, probably like three or four times before it stuck. But maybe some of it was also just I didn't have the right teachers. And, and the Internet in some ways also just made that so much easier, learning things after the Internet versus learning things before the Internet, two very different stories. Like I remember going to the library in Denmark and like trying to see if I could find some programming right. books. And it was just – it was a different world, and it never clicked with me. And that was part of – why I fell in love with the internet so much was not only did it allow me to do all these things, it allowed me to learn how to do all these things. Yeah. Um, and it was just amazing. So early 2000s, I'm, I'm into this internet stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm liking building for the web. And um, I've been a fan of this website, this company in Chicago. I'm still in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm taking my de degree at uh, the Copenhagen Business School. There's this small group of four people called 37 Signals, first of all, like what kind of name is that for a design company? Their website is just text. What? Their web design company and their tech is, website right. is all text? This doesn't make any sense. This is just intriguing, right? I am really intrigued. And then they have this blog, Signal versus Noise, where they're talking about the industry in, in a very different way from what I've heard. I'd kind of been involved with like the dot-com boom and bust industry in Denmark. And it was a very... I think it would call red herring. Like some of these magazines at the time, it's very just rah rah. Everything's great. Everything is amazing. And here's these this small band of people in Chicago, basically saying, "Do you know what? I think a lot of it's bunk. Like I think a lot right. of the ways we're doing things are wrong." Blah, blah, blah. I was a big fan. Now, Jason, one of the founders of Thirty Seven Signals, and and now my business partner at Basecamp, wrote a blog post on Signal versus Noise, asking like, "Hey, can you help me with this programming stuff?" He just asked the world essentially, right? Like he was trying to learn PHP by himself, and I was like, "Hey, I know this. Like I had basically just learned it like a couple of years earlier, but I know the answer to the question." So I'm like, again, sitting here. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. I send him an email. We start talking. Um, we start getting rolling. He decides it's easier to hire me than it is to learn how to program, and we start working together. From a distance. From a distance. I didn't even talk to Jason on the phone for like six months. We would just trade emails. We would be on ICQ, I think it was at the time. Um, started working together all remotely, which looking back at it now was really a formative experience. This idea that um, you could work remotely, not just that you could, you could make great things with yeah. tiny teams even if you're not in the same space, even if you're not in the same time zone. I mean, we're t seven time zones away. Um, it's and we would a take lot those now. lessons forward. Yeah, it's happening a lot now with kids on video games where they're creating teams where, you know, to play Overwatch or whatever it is. Yes. And they're meeting friends from different countries. They never meet in person, but they're creating these functional teams where everyone's playing a different role. And uh, it's, that's quite normal now, but back then um, it probably wasn't. And what struck me then was when you said how you just responded to this blog post what an opportunity that was just this little moment that led you to this yes. your, your business partner and then prior to that you went to that event where you met all these programmers i mean imagine if you'd got didn't go out that night you know what i'm a little tired i'll stay home it would have been very different these little moments uh -huh. that that just for you created the pathway to the to such amazing huge things you know, sometimes um, it is these tiny little things that can make a difference in our in our journeys. You know, never in other words, never miss an opportunity, and you know, always take up invites because you never know who you're going to meet. And already, you've shown me a couple of really good examples of that. And especially in the early time, you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know how you're going to work. Um, being available in that sense is a is a great idea. I think at some point the um, the ball tips. And it kind of goes the other way. And you have to learn the opposite of y saying yes all the time. You have to learn how to say no. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most powerful weapons we've used at Basecamp to get to where we are, is that at this point, once you have your gang, once you have your crew, and you have an idea you want to pursue, then it's time to sort of wean back and, and figure out how do, you, how do you stay in and focus on that. But in the beginning, until you know what you even want to do, until you have someone to do it with, yeah, making yourself available to all these things yeah so, so now you work. found this business partner and 37 signals is still going 
So 37 Signals turned into Basecamp. Okay. It started as the web design company. 2003, we started to work on Basecamp, our project management um, a collaboration tool. 2004, we launched it. 2005, it was doing so well, we didn't have to take design clients anymore. So we shuttered the design business and went Focused all, all in, in on, on, Basecamp. on Basecamp. So how big is Basecamp right now in terms of active users? Sure. So we have over 100,000 paying companies on companies, the system. Companies, yeah. Amazing. And millions of people have used the system. Including um, us, by the way. Full oh, disclosure, we are Basecamp wonderful. users. Excellent. I didn't even know that. You wouldn't know it by the dysfunction <laughs> that surrounds me on a daily basis. <laughs> Just kidding. That's uh, great. We're a customer. And what? how did you guys get to um, Basecamp? So in other words, you were two um, developers. You meet. You could have done anything. What I mean is how did you get to Basecamp is what, got you to that being the idea you were going to execute, project management. Yeah, absolutely. So we got there because we wanted to solve our own problem. And we were working with these clients, and we were just doing it over email, as most people do. The most powerful, or perhaps not powerful, but at least the most well-used project management tool in the world is email. Simply just f sending files back and forth, getting into these quote threads where you're 14 replies into it, and you're reading on the, on the margins if you want to read back. And something got dropped. Like we just we ended up looking bad to a customer, uh, to a client, and we thought this is just silly. Like we're in a mess. We have seven different threads going on essentially this one project. No one can find heads of tails of it. We're just four people at this company working with one client. Um, we know how to make software. Can't we just make something that where we can put everything on the record, everything in one place, everything is sort of sorted. We thought, yes, we can. And we started working on Basecamp just for ourselves. We spent a few months working on it with the sole intention of just not sharing it with the world at all. Then we showed it to um, Kudo Partners, another design company in Chicago that we shared an office with. And they were like, oh, can I pay for this? And we're like, uh, yes. <laughs> um, and then we went, okay, let's try to turn this into something. Maybe there are other people just like us who are sick and tired of managing projects over email. So we, we make this project um, or, or turn the project into a product and uh, a few months later launch it with very modest aspirations. Our idea was, hey, you know what? This is just a side thing. We never quit the day job here. Right. This was right. a side business. We were treating it as the fourth or the fifth client basically in the roster and, and making time for it. At the time, I was still in school. I was spending about 10 hours per week, not 10 hours a day, 10 hours per week to build this thing. Um, so. We had aspirations that were geared by that environment, which was just like, hey, if we can make 4,000 bucks a month uh, after about a year of operating this, that'd be great. Like, that'd be a great side business. That'd sure. be a great uh, product. Well, two, three weeks into it, we beat that target and blasted wow. right through it. And we're like, wow, there's something here. And it's so funny because even that, um, if you see it compared to today's standard, like, that would be a failure. Like, that's, that's not anything like four thousand dollars a month like well, what's that gonna pay for that's not a business um and not only that we were just on we were growing but growing linearly so it took over a year before we could just pay the four meager salaries that we had at the company at the time but we were stoked we didn't have this comparison that like oh you're supposed to be right. a millionaire in 12 months or now whatever all this ethos, these expectations exactly set, the expectations right? that I think now are actually hurting entrepreneurs in a lot of ways. I think there's a lot of stories out where like, oh, someone went from zero to hundreds of millions of dollars in 18 right. months. And people go like, uh, well, I'm making $2,000 yeah. a month after like six months. Now, am I an other failure? We were blessed by not having those comparisons shoved in our face, in part because the dot-com bust had just happened. And it showed everyone that these fantastical aspirations oftentimes just collapse up into thin air, right? And they just blow up. So all this is, is going on. And um, the interesting thing, too, was even when we turned it into a product for other people, we were thinking, this is for other client services companies. This is just for people who have to deal with clients because that's really when you need to to have the project management under control. And what we quickly learned was all sorts of other people were signing up. We'd have like architects signing up. We'd have churches signing up. We'd have... And how are they finding you? Uh, usually through word of mouth. Okay. So the funny thing was, since we were taking this as a side project, um, the idea of like buying advertisement or, or doing any sales in that regard never really entered our mind because it just wasn't on the table. We didn't have a budget. We hadn't raised any money. We weren't going to 
go out and pay thousands of dollars for a billboard or a radio spot or whatever else have you. So we had to do things differently. And one avenue was make a great product and make other people sort of excited to tell their friends about it. That's a great avenue, but it's also perhaps a little slow in some regards. We took another avenue as well, which was to build an audience. So I found Jason through Signal versus Noise, the blog that was started in 99. When I joined I started writing. We would write um, sometimes several articles a day on this thing. This is before even the term content management, which is yeah. really a term I hate, I had come into play. We were just sharing, right? We were yeah. sharing everything we were learning, both in terms of the business, in terms of the technical techniques we were picking up. Yeah. And then we started sharing our software as well. So that was how Ruby on Rails came to be. That I, I had picked up this new programming language, Ruby, just at the time when we were beginning work on Basecamp. And I had built a bunch of tools to make Basecamp happen, basically, my toolbox for it, because Ruby didn't have anything really at the time. And I took all, that, all those tools, put them in a box, and said to the world, hey, you can have it. Pushed it out, free, open source software. I was already in that environment. I had used a bunch of free open source software, and I was thinking like, hey, Basecamp had never gotten off the ground if I had to pay Oracle thousands of dollars for right. a database. So we used MySQL, uh, a free open source database. If I had to pay Netscape licenses for a web server, absolutely not. So we picked up Apache web server. We were using all these open source tools. So I was just steeped in it and thinking like, wow, I have something here. Maybe it's my time to A, give back, and B, maybe someone else is interested too. So well, you, ne you never thought about charging for Ruby on Rails? Which is this web? Which is basically open source web development framework. You yes. Created. So you never charge for it. Was it a sort of a loss leader to build a community that would then come to Basecamp? I never even thought about it in those terms. Just, I just thought about it in the terms of I've gotten so much good out of the open source community. As I said, these tools that we were using, the business would never have gotten off the ground if they weren't there. They would have been just gate blockers keeping us in. And I thought like I actually owed it. Like I was in debt here to the larger community and uh, of, of open source developers and users to uh, to get it out there. And secondly, I had found this programming language that really was the tipping point for me in my programming career, where I went from like programming something I have to do to make programs. Oh, it's a tool. Yeah. To finding Ruby and having my mind blown and basically like, holy crap, this is what programming can be. This is how much fun it can be. This is like creative writing. This is just such an energizing environment to be in. I want every programmer to have right. access to this. But Ruby was this very little known programming language out of Japan that very few people in the West were using because there weren't like a killer app. There wasn't like a direct access to like, how do I get to use this thing? So I thought, I have something here. Lots of people seemingly at the time, 2004, interested in building web applications. There's this new whole new wave coming. If they could get a chance to just see what I saw in Ruby, that would be amazing. Now, how many, how has Ruby then become much bigger? Oh, enormously so. Is it the standard? Yeah. Um, it's a standard in, in some regards. It's a big enough player that... Um, Twitter got started on it. GitHub is running on it. Shopify is running on it. Um, there's tons yeah, of I mean, now Airbnb, large billion dollar companies. Yes. I mean, it's amazing who's building on and, and a lot of those, your platform. A lot of those today, huge billion dollar businesses, they were started back then. Like Shopify, for example, a great uh, example of $20, uh, $20 billion business today um, was started, uh, I think, like in 2005 by... Uh, this German guy who had moved to to Canada that, that I just also met online. He was part of the Tobias Lucke was part of the initial core group for the Rails development uh, community, and he started back then. And now it's a twenty dollar million dollar twenty billion dollar business. Dollars, yeah. And that sort of like planting those seeds and seeing them grow up has just been so much more satisfying than trying to see like, oh, can we charge fifty bucks for this? Can we charge a hundred bucks right. for this? Because so, I also had the luxury of already having a business. Yeah. That I didn't need Ruby and Rails to pay my bills because hey, Basecamp is doing pretty well already. Like let's yeah. just ride on that. And thing. Basecamp still thriving and Absolutely. You know, a hundred thousand companies, that's pretty impressive. And that's a subscription based software as a service. I know that obviously software as a service is a you know, huge part of um, of that economy, of the digital economy now. Uh, we don't really know too much about it here because we're just humble sneaker <laughs> shoe dogs. Uh, but well, thing, uh, I know enough to know that this most is people now... just use it, right? Like exactly. as you say, you guys yep. use your base camp. There's probably a bunch of other apps that you use. And I, I don't really like software as a service as a term. I mean, we did software as a service uh, before that was even a term. And we had to convince people like, hey, putting in your credit card online is actually not a scary thing. Like it's totally normal. Right. And, 
it's just software right yeah like, yeah and what what i also like is how you've had this great success with Basecamp. um you have this great success with ruby on rails albeit non-financially but your contribution to some of these websites is pretty amazing your impact i would say uh, some of the names you you threw out and I threw out are like some of the biggest names in in uh, on the web, um, but then you also started to take the knowledge you gained and write books. So you're contributing even further, and you've actually written four books. And I want to dig into a couple of those books right now because I think some really interesting content here. Um, one of the books you wrote was called probably actually it was Rework your most recent. Rework was our biggest success. That was okay. probably 2010. Our most recent is it doesn't have to be crazy at work. Okay, and so let's start with rework the biggest the biggest one, and this is a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and most importantly, Sunday Times bestseller, <laughs> um, more than half a million copies sold, and it was really about starting and running a business a better way, and this is from your learnings, presumably from building Basecamp, and um, there's a couple sort of things in here that I grabbed onto that I wanted to have you explain. So number one, one of the lessons from rework was emulate drug dealers. So go on, you're going to have to add some color to that. Yeah. Um, so what we found out in part because we didn't have a marketing budget for Basecamp was no one was going to just show up and pay an unknown company for a piece of software they didn't know how it worked up front. That just wasn't going to happen. Right. That was the traditional way most software had been sold. Like if you were at that time to to buy Photoshop or whatever, you'd go in a store and you'd, you'd give a pack and you'd pay, I don't know, 500 bucks for that. That was just not going to happen in our case. We were not going to break through that. We had to basically force people to experience what Basecamp was. And the easiest way to do that is to give it away for free. There's nothing more powerful than free when it comes to attracting uh, someone's attention. Sure. Everyone wants something for free. So we started out with this model of giving the software away for free, in the beginning at least, that you'd get a real proper chance to try it. At the time, we were running a freemium model where you could even use Basecamp forever for free yeah. if you stayed below certain limits, you didn't have too many projects and so forth. And that was really what kickstarted it. And, and, and the link with, with drug deals is you get the first hit for free and then you get hooked right. and then you're going to come back for more and then, then you're you going to shut pay them for off. <laughs> so that's what we did, right? Like we gave the software away for free. We got people hooked and then they went, do you know what? I I'm going to pay for Basecamp, even though they would never have considered doing that if they hadn't gotten the first free hit. Yeah. So is the, is the book rework all about the Basecamp story? Is it, it's way more of the base general story. than that, I'd say. The, the book we wrote before that, our first book, was called Getting Real, which yeah. was very focused on, here's how we built Basecamp. Here's the specific steps to take for web applications and how to apply them. And then we found the same thing as we did with Basecamp, the product, that the ideas that we had about building software, we kept hearing from people who were not in the software business at all, telling us, like, do you know what? This really right. works for me, too. And we went... That's interesting. Yeah. So we went for a broader audience with Rework and basically took a bunch of ideas of how we'd been running our company, how we'd been dealing with marketing, how we'd been doing all these things that were really not specific to software, but very um, general to entrepreneurs all over the world, regardless of which industry they were in, packaged them up in Rework and, and basically put it out there. Yeah. And I think great business stories are not in just don't have to be industry specific. And you can read uh, you know, a lot of those lessons will, will trade across industries quite easily. Um, talk a little bit about um, some of the other lessons that you teach in Rework about building a better business. So uh, one I like was meetings are toxic. I think that one might explain itself. Th that one has been a stable for a long time and it always resonates. I, so few people that I meet, especially if they're creatives and individual contributors, you're like, hey, do you love meetings? No one answers yes. Right. No one's like, yes, I love meetings. I wish I had more meetings. I wish my calendar was even tightly packed with these meetings. Most people go like, no. Yeah. And it's really annoying. I can't get my work done because yeah. of these meetings. And there's just there's this recognition that something is broken without an impetus of doing something about it. So we put our story out in part to say like, you know what? We run a software company with over 100,000 paying customers. We have 50 some people. We have very few meetings. Like on a weekly basis, I'll get on a call with someone from the company maybe once, maybe twice. That's about it. And That's, what replaces it? Corridor conversation? Not even that. For us, it's mostly asynchronous conversation that we write something up, that we have um, 
on Basecamp. We'll post a message if there's a new project we want to start, if we want to get an update on something, if we have just an insight. We will share it in a way where people can digest that at their own leisure. That we're not puncturing their day where, hey, you show up at 9 and then you get 45 minutes and then you have a 9.45. Right? What kind of work will you get started if you only have 45 minutes to do it? Not that interesting work, in my opinion, in my experience, that most of the core creative work you have to do, you can't do in these tiny blocks. If you are slicing up your day into these tiny work moments, yeah. you're not going to make the true progress that you really want. You need two hours, three hours, maybe even four hours. And the tragedy of that was uh, Jason asked at a conference recently, a uh, room of 600 people. When was the last time you had three or four hours to yourself? There was like a handful of hands that went up out of 600. That is tragic. And a lot of the blame lies on meetings and overusing meetings for things that they're not good at. Meetings are good at some things. They're not great at, say, distributing information. You can just write that up. And someone can read that on their own leisure. They're not good at doing status report where you just go around a table like, what have you been working on? Oh, those what are the worst because on? what happens what you is you now on? feel obligated like, oh, I've got to look busy. So you end exactly. up, how much information can I give to make sure everyone knows I've got a lot of shit going on? So the meeting ends up being four hours because everyone's yes. laundry listing yes. all and, of their and, and couple and of the other round of the table is sitting snoring, right? <laughs> exactly. And what's happening is that those things are free. They're, they're robbing people of the satisfaction of doing good work. Yeah. So... We've been really anti-meetings, and, and one of the sort of pressures on that, that that has really helped us is we're not in the same office. That is it, one of the traps of the office is just how easy it is to call a meeting, how easy it is to That's gather right. people around a table. It's too easy. It should be harder. Um, and it, it goes even as fundamental as just how you run your calendar. In a lot of places, calendars are open. You can just go on someone else's calendar in, in a lot of companies and say, hey, I'm going to block these two hours of your day. Yeah. I'm going to steal that amount of your time. And, and who's going to say no to that? They're not, right? So there, there goes that day, yeah. right? It's very yeah. easy to get your day punctured in such a way that it's use or useless for making true progress. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the fact that you're, not, you're, you're working remotely. And I want to jump to another book you wrote, which is called Remote. Uh, office not required where you kind of you wrote a whole book about this idea of not uh, having to be office based and so tell me a little bit about the argument for and the pitfalls of remote working in your opinion sure so the reason we wrote remote was um, we'd been working remotely at Basecamp for what 12 14 years at the uh, at the time and I thought everyone knows what the benefits are everyone knows how uh, wonderful it is to not have a commute, for example. I mean, especially if you live in Los Angeles. I just came in here, and I had the easiest commute from Malibu into this office here, and that was still 40 minutes. Try doing that at like 8 in the morning, and you're oh, going to sit... Oh, trust me, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to sit in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, right? And um, when you take something like the commute, it is one of the top factors that people point to of what's making them miserable every day. It's linked to all sorts of negative health effects for raising your, your cortisol and stress levels and uh, everything. Yeah. Like a lot of people just take that for granted. That is the yeah. price of having a job that you have to have a commute. And um, first of all, I haven't had a commute in 20 years. And so hearing that, hearing about this, and then occasionally finding myself in that position. I mean, I'll occasionally find myself in like gridlock traffic in LA because I need to go somewhere and I go like, how do people live like this? Mm -hmm. So we had all of these arguments. Well, look, look at the state of me. This is what it does to you. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I mean, you, you, you just you want to spend your time in a better way, right? And, and if you went like, hey, you could have another two hours every day for mm -hmm. something more productive than sitting in a car idling and releasing CO2 and whatever into yeah. the atmosphere, who wouldn't go like, hey, that sounds like a great idea, tell me more. Yeah. Well, when it comes to remote work, I think it got kind of a bad rep from both sides. Uh, it got a bad rep from workers because in the early days of, of remote work, it was synonymous with outsourcing, sending jobs to India or whatever. And that's unfortunate, both because that doesn't really work. Um, it's not that uh, that um, remote work means you can just be wherever you want in any time zone, uh, whatever, and it's all good. No, you still need to overlap. You still need to have opportunities to sync up and be synchronous either in chat or um, video chat or, or something else where you can kind of uh, get in sync. 
if everything happens like a day delayed, like sending an email to India, work, mm -hmm. people working in India time, people are going to go crazy. So workers didn't like it from that perspective. And then I think a lot of executives had sort of, I think, unfortunately, some very, uh, I think in the book we call them cavemen opinions or, or concepts about what work is. That yeah. if someone is sitting in an office chair in front of a computer, that means that they're working. That means that they're going, doing good work. And my job as a manager is to try to get people to sit in that chair for as long as possible. Yeah. And that means I'm going to get the best work possible. And even when I say it like that, right, we almost can't help but laugh. And so would anyone else who's ever worked in an office that just sitting in, on a chair at an office in front of a computer does not mean that you're working. And even if you are working, it doesn't mean you're producing good work. Um, so the whole concept of like what is work and why do we go to the office and, and whatever needed to be more thoroughly addressed. And once you start looking at it, a lot of the arguments for why we need an office totally fall apart. So even if you take like, well, people don't have to sit in front of a computer in an office to, to work and that falls apart, most people will go like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, because they know it themselves, right? They know that they sit in front of a computer all the time and they're not working all the time and that there's not such a linear relationship between those two things. Um, but as you sort of dive into it deeper, all these things sort of start to, to fall over. The excuses. One of the excuses that was just recently knocked down by a, a wonderful academic study was the idea of the open office being this wonderful collaborative right. space that if you just put people at long desks next to each other, you can have so much more serendipitous conversation and creativity mm -hmm. flowing, blah, 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 blah. And lots of people worked in those environments. I worked in those environments back in the early 2000s know that that wasn't the case what the case was the case was we would go like boom headphones put your headphones on, on yeah. dive Music into up. things mm -hmm. try to just get my focus going and what uh, uh, this i think it was a stanford um, study showed was that having the open office for example decreases collaboration that people are more likely to go into their cocoons and try to filter out all the interruptions that are going on beside them mm -hmm. because that's the only way they can find work. So re or, or the remote book basically tries to go through all these arguments to bring a devastating case that every business should consider remote work as an option and that there's extreme advantages both to the company and to the employee if that is an option. Um, and it has to be based on trust too. I think that's another big thing is, you know, do I, you know, there's... Do I think that my my guy who's working from home today is cranking away or are they watching Judge Judy or taking a sly doc quick doctor's appointment or you know what I mean? And you that's you probably the number the, I, I, the number one, number two um, objection we get is that trust issue. And my reply is always first, why are you hiring people you don't trust? Like, why <laughs> would you pay someone a, a, a good salary? Why would you let them work on important work? if you don't trust them. Yeah. Second of all, my experience, and I've talked to lots of entrepreneurs who done remote work, is that the fear is unfounded. And in fact, the sure. opposite is true, that people end up overworking as a default when there's no clear separation between home and work, when you can just take your laptop from whatever your, your bedroom office yeah. into the living room and continue working, continue doing emails into the night. Uh, most people, unless they're pushed back on it, will end up working more hours, more diligently. Yeah. Um, and what we've had to do, do at, at Basecamp is exactly remind people like, hey, work is eight hours at Basecamp every day. Eight hours is enough. Eight hours is plenty. Eight hours is everything we need to get the wonderful work we want to put out there mm -hmm. done. You don't need to work 10 hours. You don't need to work 12 hours. In fact, we would really prefer if you're not, not only just prefer, if you're continuously overworking, um, something's wrong and we need to correct that. We need to either correct the expectations are being set um, for you or maybe um, you need help in some regards if you can't get your normal work done. There's all these other things. And then finally, I'd say um, if someone is, is worried about workers sitting at home Googling off, watching Judge Judy or, or PlayStation or whatever, can't you just tell them to work? Like, why are you not evaluating the work? Why are you evaluating the input? You should always be evaluating the work. Right. How can you otherwise t tell the difference between a wonderful worker and a, and, a, and a poor worker, even if they're in the office? The output of work is not, or the purpose of work is not hours spent. It's the result. It's the result, right? Yeah. And managers need to step up their game such that they're evaluating results, not input. Yeah. Great advice. Didn't you write something about workaholics or there was a there was one of your something in one of your books about workaholics? Yes. So I think workaholism, 
um, is unfortunately one of these uh, syndromes that uh, everyone seems to love cheering for. That we keep celebrating the people who are working 80 or 100 or even 120 badge hours a honor. week. Mm. It's a badge of honor. And as we say in the book, no, it's a batch of stupidity that in most cases just working my coffee out then, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> working more hours, even if you have the best intentions, even if you run the business, is counterproductive, that you don't actually get more results that way. And in many cases, it's linked to this um, sort of sacrifice culture of like, well, I also don't need to sleep. Like I can get by on four or five or six hours a night. The science is just in on these things. And the science says, no, you can't. You're literally yeah. getting stupider if you're not sleeping. You're going to do worse work. And I think workaholism as a, as a general aspirational thing for entrepreneurs is completely bunk. That's why we put our example out there and say, you know what? We've never worked more than 40 hours a week as a standard. Has there been a crisis here and there? Of course there has. Has there been a Sunday where something was burning down and we just had to fix this? Of course there is. But is that the normal mode of operation? No. Is that something we celebrate? No. Is that something we want? W do we want employees to work 60 hours a week? Absolutely not. Um, and we want to put that message out there as a counter to everyone else that goes rah, rah, rah. If you just keep grinding, if you just keep hustling 18 hours a day, that's yeah. where you find success. I think that that's simply just bunk. Yeah, I, I heard this expression the other day, struggle porn. Um, yes. If you heard that, I don't know if that's maybe just me, but I think it was uh, my good friend Ben Dietz. Shout out Ben Dietz if you're listening. Um, he probably isn't. He's too good for us. But uh, I think Ben Dietz had sent me something about struggle porn because he's 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 a bit anti anti Gary V. And of course, I'm pro Gary V. But uh, it's this idea that we're all like, um, you know, what's the word? Uh, Glamorizing the struggle. Yes. And uh, and in some I, cases, it's probably I, I, I read that medium post and I thought it had some very good critiques. What, what I'll say is, I mean, I'm wearing Gary's sneakers today. I, I've known Gary for a long time. I love a lot of Gary's messages. I don't love that part of the message. And well, I, he sleeps. He'll tell you he sleeps. Well, the, maybe good the sleep night. part, yeah. but but I think otherwise. What a lot of people take away from the message, even if that's not the intention, there's this sort of implied sense that if I just grind harder, that's how I'm going to get success. And yeah. I, I thought it was a great point in that article on struggle porn that there's so much survivorship bias. The world is full of people who work to themselves to the bones and failed. Yeah. In fact. Just because you made it, if you're attributing that solely to the fact that you outworked someone, you're delusional. Because there's a thousand other people just like you that work just as hard as you yeah. and failed. Yeah. That this is not the differentiator. I mean, Gary might think otherwise, but I don't think Gary succeeded in the way he has just because he worked another three, four hours a night yeah. that everyone else did. No, because he brought a lot of other things to the table. And I think that's sometimes the problem with this struggle porn idea is that it's it's kind of permission to say like i earned it yeah. this is why like i make millions of dollars this is why my business is a success not because i'm actually uniquely creative and insightful and had ideas at the right time no because i just worked harder and therefore i earned it and i think that's really damaging to have that both as a self-perception to think that the only reason you are where you are was because you put in those 18 hours a day because then you're going to be stuck in that Group, yeah, right? listen, there's a lot of uh, single moms who are working three jobs and they're working a lot harder than I am. And they're not bragging about it, right? right they're not right. bragging about working three exactly. uh, yeah. uh, three okay. jobs at the same time. And what's fascinating was um, how your story about Basecamp was, was not a strategic move to uh, build that. It was really fixing a need for yourself that turned into a business. What's amazing is that we just talked to um, a guy called Casey Holiday on our last podcast who founded Kalo, which is the um, the rings, the wedding rings made out of silicon. And that came not from a planned business, but he wanted to solve a problem for himself. So when you said that off the bat, I'm like, here we go again. It's not, you know, sometimes um, success comes from just really, you know, organic fixing of a genuine need and then realizing, wow, this actually has application other places. Um, so yeah, hard work will will not get you very far if you're digging a hole in the wrong direction. Um, and obviously, it's you know solving real needs for people is a big one, and um, and being in the right place at the right time and taking advantage of people you meet and and a lot of the lessons you've taught us today. Uh, I want to talk quickly about one of your other books. Um, it doesn't have to be crazy at work was the, is the title of the book. And what I liked about this was 
about running a calm company. So it's about running a, a calm company uh, by foregoing the lure of excessive growth. Now, I thought that was really interesting because I talk about this a lot, how businesses or human nature is we always go for more. And you might have a very profitable company that employs great team members, that's doing good, that has loyal community of customers. Why can't you just live profitably in that space? It's just that our instinct is to like keep going more, 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 and then you end up ruining it. Um, so when I read this, I'm thinking, man, I always think this way. So tell me, tell me about this from your perspective. You, you really summed it up. Um, there are so many entrepreneurs that we talk to when we talk about like, what were your favorite moments of running this company? Um, and a lot of the times the story goes back to when they were just 20, 30, 50 people. You were like, I knew everyone. I was really hands on with the product. Um, we could move really fast. It wasn't a lot of bureaucracy. And then, well, now we're like 500 people. It's just different. And like, hey, I have a meeting with HR where we have to discuss some policy <laughs> in an hour that's going to go for three hours. So let me talk to you later. They didn't seem like happy people. So when Jason and I uh, considered where we wanted to take the business and how we wanted to run it, we wanted to stay in that happy land. Why can't we just stay where we are profitable, making a great product, working directly with the people making the product and having that be enough? Um, in fact, we took that to the extreme this year. So last year, 2017, was the biggest year in terms of revenue for Basecamp the product. That's usually a time where everyone goes like, hey, let's pop the champagne, let's expand the office, let's hire a bunch of new people, let's do all these things. We did the exact opposite. We said, we're good, this is good. Let's stay here and institute in a hiring freeze. Wow. And basically said, we don't want to grow the product team at all. We have all these ideas we could pursue. We even have some backlog products that were doing very well. We had another product next to Basecamp called High Rise, a CRM system. It was doing very well, multi-million dollar business, and we went, to do that justice, we'd have to hire another 15, 20 people maybe. I don't want to run a people of 70 people because we're just at the cusp with about 50-ish people at Basecamp where we don't need another full layer of middle management. And there's nothing wrong with that middle management per se. It's just like that's just not what we wanted out of the business. And we knew if we were going to grow the company from 50-something to 75, we wouldn't stop at 75. We'd go to 100, we'd go to 150 so, and we'd just keep going. Do so you put that project on ice or do you start another small company with that project? So we actually, we spun out that product for a while and had another team run it. And it wasn't a great experience for all sorts of reasons. So what we ended up doing was we shut it off for new customers. We continued to run the application. Everyone who already bought it, it's been running for 11 years. And we have customers who've been with that product for 11 years. And we've long had this idea that legacy matters. And people look at the legacy and they judge you and how you deal with that. So we wanted to keep that going. Another example of that, we, we made a throwaway sort of single focus app called Tadalist back in 2005. It was a free product. It was basically a loss leader, an uh, intention grabber for, hey, if, if you like managing your to-dos just for yourself and Tadalist, you should check out Basecamp for Business. Well, we shut that down for new signups, I think in like 2007. We still run it. 10 mm -hmm. years later, a free product um, has about 1,000 people a week who after 10 years that we've shut it down still like to use wow. it. And that's not free, but I think... Uh, Investing in your legacy absolutely comes back. Yeah, yeah. I, I think of my or the companies that I admire the most, like Porsche or Leica or whatever that has a uh, long history. If you have a, a, a 72 Porsche and like carburetors break, Porsche will like make that stuff for you. Right. If you have a Leica M2 from, I don't know what that is, 42, 1942, you can get that repaired. There's someone there having the spare yeah. parts, having the knowledge, having all this stuff. I think watches is another great example, yeah. right? Like there's yeah. this long legacy of investing in, in software. That's just the opposite is true, right? For like sure. the most egregious example is Google, who seems to like launch a messaging service every other month and then shut down like at random just yeah. apps and people hate that no yeah. one likes to be put on a, a force of like something being taken away from that anyway so we ended up basically just saying we're going to run this until the end of the internet that's our term for it the end wow. of the internet that's that's how long you can trust that these applications we've ever launched will run but we can't keep developing it because if we want to stay this small ish company 50 some people 
Basecamp requires the bulk of our attention, and we need to work on products that we're using all the time. Basecamp was that, high rise really wasn't. We weren't doing sales, we weren't sort of in tune with our customers on that. So it wasn't as enjoyable to work on. So we shut it down, or shut it off for new customers, even though it was a multi-million dollar business, with some investment could have done even better, but we already had enough. Basecamp as a business is already plenty profitable. Yeah, Jason fantastic. and I don't need any more money in our bank accounts than what that can generate. Um, and then we wanted to protect these other things. Like we were thinking about like, how could I want to stay at Basecamp for the next 20 years? A lot of entrepreneurs, they'll, they'll run through the opening phase. They'll get to seven, eight, 10 years, and then they go like, I'm done, I'm out. I'll start the next thing. And the reason they go like, I'm done, I'm out, is usually because the company grew to a level where they're like, I'm not enjoying myself. I don't right. want to go to meetings all day long. Um, I want to work with product. I want to work with a small team. I want to be intimate with the customer in a different way. And I can't do that if I have this large company. So they sell it and then they start again. And for some people, a very small niche that is extremely well publicized, they turned into successful serial entrepreneurs. The vast majority do not get a second hit. Right. Most entrepreneurs who have one hit, they are so enamored with their success that they think they have magic fingers, that, that everything that they touch will turn into gold. So they try again. You know what? It didn't work. And it wasn't as fun. And it wasn't the same people. And there was all these other things with it. And now they fucked up a good thing. They had a great business. They could have stayed with it, but they sold it off. They started again. And now starting again sucks. And <laughs> Jason and I had the humility of looking ourselves in the mirror and going, do you know what? There's a pretty good chance that Basecamp is the best idea we'll ever have. That there will not be another idea that'll sort of work as well as this is. We'll keep trying. We'll keep digging. We'll keep playing with technology so and so on. let's not blow this one. But yeah. you know what? Let's not fuck up Basecamp, right? right. Let, let's just, uh, this could be a company where I could work for the next 20 or 30 years. Yeah, fascinating. Really interesting. And if you want to dig more into this, uh, there's a book that's written, um, of course. It's called It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work. How to Run a Calm Company by Foregoing the Lure of Excessive Growth. And that's uh, David's own book. So uh, check it out. And, and, and all of these things we've talked about are in book form that you can check out. I want to talk, uh, as we start to wrap up here, a couple of things about your, your personal life. I know that you're also a race car driver and you race a, it's a Le Mans race car, which is, is that all I, all I know about Le Mans racing is that you don't you run to the car at the beginning? Is that or is that, that that used to be the case back when the race was started in, in okay. the early twenty? Uh, I just remember the cars were on the grid, all the drivers were at the side, and you got to run, jump in, and drive. It, it was a very dramatic start, <laughs> which unfortunately was horribly why did they unsafe. Get, yeah, why do they get rid of that? It's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> they actually just started reenacting that. So now there's okay. a reenactment at the start of the race. Uh, at least if you, you're back, they had that where they rented, but just for the photos. Because the thing is, you really don't want to go into a car and go 200 miles an hour without getting properly strapped in. Exactly. With your yeah. Don't do your seat butt up yes. to get off the grid first. So you're, you race cars. How often do you do this? So I've been in a, a number of different series over the past seven years I've been doing it. Um, the main thing I've been doing is something called the uh, FIA World Endurance Championship or WEC. Uh, I've been doing that for about five years. So this is globetrotting uh, community of racers and, and marquees that fly around to about nine different locations around the world. Um, we would go everywhere from places in Europe, the famous racetracks of Spa and Silverstone, yeah. Le Mans itself, of course, mm -hmm. but also go to Brazil and Bahrain and China and Japan and so forth. These 24-hour races? Um, the main event, which is called the Le Mans 24. So yeah. the 24 hours of Le Mans, which is a 24-hour race. Three drivers, one car. You have to make it to the finish. Have you raced in the 24? I've raced in the 24 hours of Le Mans seven times. Wow. Uh, I've won it in class with Aston Martin in 2014. I've been on the podium there four times. It's my favorite race in the world. It's the whole reason why I got into racing at this level because I wanted to compete at the 24 hours of Le Mans. And you, that was a that was a dream of yours when you were a kid. It's sort of or when you got into in, racing. In, it, I I kind of had like um, a dream I didn't even know was a dream. So back in the 90s, uh, I'd watch this race on the TV in Denmark, and I was always fascinated with it. But it seemed so remote, so far fetched from my situation and where I was that it never formed into a dream of like, I want to do this thing because that seemed like just an impossibility. 
in fact, I didn't even get my driver's license until I was 25 years old. Really? Um, living in Copenhagen, didn't need a car, couldn't afford a car. Um, so those things matched up pretty nicely. Uh, and it wasn't until I got to the U.S. actually in 2005 uh, that I had just got my driver's license that year. And in 2007, I got to sit in a race car and drive that for the first time. And that was when that formative appreciation of that race came in and bubbled into a dream. Uh, Tom Christensen, the guy who's won the 24 hours of Ma more than any other t uh, driver in history. He's won it nine times, happens to be Danish. Um, so that was kind of what helped propel right. this dream to, hey, there's this Dane, like we're a tiny little country of six million yeah, people. Could How could it. this yeah. guy do it, right? This is amazing. I want to get there. I want to get to that uh, event and participate at the same time. And I, I got the good fortune of participating before he, uh, Tom retired from driving at 24 hours of Mar for a couple of years. I started in 2012 and has done it every year since. Fantastic. Wow. What a what a thing to do and uh, amazing. And you live in, so are you between Copenhagen and Malibu now? Do you move around the world? So we've been moving around the world uh, quite a lot for the past 10 years, but Copenhagen wasn't the list of destinations. I left Copenhagen in 2005 after spending 25 years there. And I thought, you know what? 25 years is a good amount of time to spend in one city. Let's try something else. So I moved to Chicago first, uh, mm. spent about five years in Chicago. Um, and then I kind of got tired of the winter there. Yep. I started going, uh, coming out here to, to LA, to Malibu in particular. And then as, as chance had it again, as we talk these chance moments, uh, I went to a car event in Spain. And my wife and I had been talking about, oh, we'd love to live in Europe. We'd never considered Spain. I don't know why. We go to this car event in Mabea, Spain. It's down on the south coast. Um, it's November, uh, late November, and it's just beautiful. It's just gorgeous. The food is amazing. The people are amazing. Everything's just amazing. We're like, this is just like, we should spend some time here. Mm. So. Other happenstance was one of the guys we were down there with, we were like um, trying to talk, about, can you help us figure out a way we can rent an apartment or something? And somehow that got mistranslated into like, oh, you guys want to buy a house. <laughs> we hadn't even learned this. So we're like meeting up with the realtor and like, we're going to take you to this house. And we're like, what are you talking about house? We're, we're just looking for a place to rent for like a few mm. weeks out of the year. And we're like, well, I mean, we have the appointment. It's in 15 minutes. Do you want to come? And we're like, okay, fine. So we go with the realtor to this place and see the most amazing house I've ever seen in my life. We walk in there and are absolutely floored and just go like, actually, maybe we could live here. <laughs> we ended up buying that house and then spending uh, the majority of our time over the next seven years living in Spain. Really? Yes. Wow. And the, and the kids, you have kids? I had two kids there. They're both born in Spain. Wow. Um, they speak Spanish? Yeah, better than I do, mm -hmm. I should say, but mm -hmm. not fully. Mabea is uh, is very much an expat city, which yeah. what made it so easy for us. There's a lot of Brits, uh, a lot of people from the rest of Europe down there. But we lived there for about seven years with both the kids. Now my oldest is six, and he just started kindergarten. But he, um, we're gonna stay in, in Malibu for for Fantastic. that period. Of, of Fantastic! Fantastic! Yeah, good. Well, I'll probably see you on the beaches of Zuma at some point. So I'm down there quite often. Um, and this has been a fantastic episode. I know that we could, any of these things, whether it's base camp or Ruby on Rails or the race car driving or the four books you've written, each of those, we could go down that, those paths and spend an hour. So I felt like we've skimmed a bit. I mean, it's really a fascinating story that um, not only have you built these great companies, but you're really a philosopher on business, which I think is fascinating. And so um, I'm I'm really interested to see where this goes for you. I'm sure there's other potential companies. There's definitely other books and philosophies to come out. Um, how do people follow you and stay in touch and keep an eye on what you're doing? Social media, what's the best way to? It's funny, I used to just blurt out Twitter. Like yeah. that, that's the way to follow me. I, I've grown more disillusioned with social media over the past few years, but I am still addicted, I think is the correct word, to Twitter and will often tweet like 40 times a day on exactly all these topics that we've been talking about today. So at DHH on Twitter is a great place. If you're into visuals, I'm also on Instagram at DHH79. Uh, and then we blog still on Signal versus Noise. It's 20 years running now at the blog. Wow, uh, it's coming up on its noise. 20th anniversary next year. Uh, that's signalvnoise.com. Great place to find our latest writings, a bunch of the new material that we use to develop goes there first and then it ends up in a book five maybe ten years later there you go so there's plenty of opportunities to follow david and his work what a great story what a what a human 
uh, making us feel bad about ourselves. And I got to get out now, <laughs> work a little harder. Um, that's David Heinemeyer Hansen. Thank you so much. And this has been CEOs Wear Sneakers. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.